House leaders roll out their plan for funding a massive transportation initiative. Will it draw enough support to pass? Battle lines between supporters and opponents of a religious liberty bill hardened today as each side rallied its troops at the Capitol. And remember one year ago tonight? Snowpocalypse brought Metro Atlanta to its knees. Has the state fixed the problem that kept us all frozen in place? Lawmaker starts right now. Good evening and welcome to Lawmakers. I'm Bill Nygut. It's day seven of the 2015 session and we're starting to get a handle on what the big themes are going to be this year. Roads and religious liberties are topping tonight's list. Pat St. Clair has the latest on how those issues played out down at the Capitol today. Hi, Pat. Hi, Bill. Thanks. We now have a jumping off point for how the state may fund much needed improvements to Georgia's transportation infrastructure. Lawmakers laid their cards on the table with a funding bill that will be introduced tomorrow in the House. And the headline is no increase in state taxes. No one disputes that Georgia has a big problem with aging roads and bridges. Today, House Transportation Committee Chairman Jay Roberts said if approved, the proposed bill will generate $1 billion in new transportation funding without increasing the tax burden on Georgians. First, by raising money with a bond issue. We're going to have a significant bond package that will provide statewide bridge, bridge maintenance, transit funding, and other projects. We're going to allow Georgia to lever leverage its excellent credit rating to borrow needed funds at a low cost. In addition, Robert says a tax increase will be avoided by converting to a straight excise tax on motor fuel and getting rid of the current sales tax. And for the first time, mass transit will get serious consideration. And we believe at this time, it is time for the state to look at transit funding, not only now, but for the future. The bill calls for a fee on alternative vehicles, including electric cars and those fueled by propane and natural gas. Of course, there are many other components to the bill, but when all is figured in, Robert says it adds up to a billion dollars for transportation. Now, the governor is already responding to today's release of the transportation bill, calling it, quote, a positive step forward. He says it's a strong starting point for negotiations, but acknowledges that there is still a long way to go as the plan makes its way through the General Assembly. Well, there were dueling news conferences today on the Capitol on the contentious issue of religious liberty. A group of prominent Baptist clergy from across the state squared off against leaders of the Georgia Baptist Convention. At the heart of the debate is a religious liberty bill co-sponsored by State Senator Josh McCoon and State Representative Sam Teasley, who says he never expected a controversy over a bill aimed at protecting a person's right to freedom in religious expression. That government shall not be able to burden somebody's, a person's free exercise of religion unless there's a compelling state interest, or put in layman's terms, a really good reason, and that it's the least restrictive means possible of accomplishing that compelling state interest. That is simply what this bill does. J. Robert White is the executive director of the Georgia Baptist Convention. He says this bill is not about discrimination. Those who claim that this bill will be used to discriminate against social groups in our culture are fear-mongering and have not one single shred of evidence to back their claims. If this was the case, it would be going on in the 30 states that have already adopted such, and it's not. Now, on the other side, an interdenominational group argues the bill is unneeded in Georgia. They say it will open the door to discrimination and even child abuse by people who could claim they can ignore other laws because they are following their religious beliefs. We do not need a bill in Georgia that would uh, harm in any way or make it more difficult uh, to convict child abusers. We do not need a new law in Georgia that would make it easier for individuals and businesses to justify discrimination. HB 29 is not about religious freedom. It's not about religious liberty. It is about the right to discriminate. Discriminate against gays, against women, against children, against African-Americans. As a Georgian, 
who happens to be a Baptist, I don't want that done in my name. Now, if you're wondering what happens next, we can tell you House Bill 29 was filed in the House, but so far there has not been a bill filed in the Senate. Neither version of the bill has been assigned to a committee yet. We will keep you posted on their progress. Also under the Gold Dome today, House Democrats held their second town hall meeting of the week to explain their economic security agenda. Their main goals are job creation, taxpayer empowerment, and helping small businesses. Their legislation includes the Fair Chance at Employment Act, which would prohibit the use of credit checks against prospective and current employees, and the Self-Employment Act, which would extend the time entrepreneurs could receive unemployment benefits as long as they meet certain criteria. We expect House Democrats to round out the week with their third town hall meeting tomorrow, focusing on shared responsibility. We'll have more on that in tomorrow's Capitol Report. That's it for us here. Bill, back to you. Thanks, Pat. A pretty interesting day down there at the Capitol. So we're going to start digging into some of the topics that Pat just talked about. And we're going to start with the transportation tax issue. Joining me to break it down, Todd Ream, a Republican political consultant and editor of the popular Georgia Pundit.com. I encourage you to take a look at his work every morning. Liz Flowers is the executive director of the Georgia Senate Democratic Caucus and a media and government relations consultant. Greg Bluestein is a political reporter for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. And Loretta Lepore is a well-known Republican activist and media expert. So thank you all for being here. Look, we've been talking uh, for weeks about the fact that we knew this big uh, 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 tax bill or this new bill, big bill for transportation, a billion plus dollars was going to come due, but nobody was going to talk about how to pay for it. Now we've heard from the speaker this afternoon how they're going to pay for it. Greg, can you give us just the broad strokes of what the House leader announced today? Yeah, we finally have a, what, what it was called a starting point. The governor said it was a starting point. House Speaker Ralston said it was a starting point. What it would mean is basically right now, 29 or so cents uh, a gallon goes into a different, uh, a whole different uh, line of revenue streams. This would basically... Well, let, let's even stop there. Okay. Right now, when I go to buy gas, there is a 29 cent tax on each gallon that currently is divided into several pots, state, local jurisdictions, among other things. Okay, right? You got it. Go forward. And this would all be <laughs> sort of put in the state pile under this proposal, which means that locals who right now have their own sort of local uh, revenue stream would have to levy their own taxes if they want to keep that going. So the local jurisdictions are losing whatever percentage of that money they get, and they have to look to see whether it's they're losing enough revenue, they've got to find some other source and increase their own gas tax. You got it. There's a sort of an escape valve <clears throat> built into legislation that allows these, these locals to, to levy a, a new tax if they want to. Um, if they levy a tax, I think it was over 3%, they'd have to do a ref referendum of their own to do that. But this would, would give them new powers to do so, but it also sort of, you know, shifts the debate in, into the hands of locals to raise those taxes. So, and the other thing we'll say, and then bring in the, everybody else, the panel, to talk about this, is they also propose a tax now on electric vehicles, two to three hundred dollars, I think. Two hundred for, uh, for, rec <clears throat> for, for drivers and three hundred for commercial users, which right now would be just a few million dollars, but as, this, as electric cars grow more popular, it would be a bigger funding stream. Okay. Uh, Liz, the Democrats have been saying for some time, and you're one of them, Show us the money. How are you going to pay for this? Well, now they have. What does their plan look like to you? Well, since we've just seen it uh, talked about today, there actually has not been a bill circulated. Mm -hmm. We anticipate that coming tomorrow, uh, but we have seen the outline of it. And it does give us a trial balloon. Uh, I don't think this is going to be the end of what we see, and we may see multiple uh, forms of it appear. Uh, there are some sticking points that I think are going to be in. Greg Bluestein brought up a couple, which is the local, the cities and counties who um, have maybe existing lost, East Bloss programs that are going to be grandfathered in, but once they expire, are gone. So while they may get an, an interesting um, a stay, essentially, for right now, um, it's, it may force local governments to go back in and tax their residents and kind of shift that burden. Loretta, one of the clever things about this plan, however, is it does shield members of the House and Senate from uh, having to say they voted for a tax increase, well, yes? Right, it does. So it's a very complex schematic that they have laid out, blueprint, um, and we'll see if it is, in fact, truly revenue neutral. 
Um, you know, as Liz said, we haven't seen the bill. Nobody's seen the bill yet, um, other than those that have drafted it. Um, it'll be interesting also to see who the sponsors of the bill are and who's going to take this under their wing. Obviously, um, the chairman of the Transportation Committee, Representative Shaw, will be the lead sponsor, but who else signs on with him? Um, and then how they communicate about this bill to the public will be very important. And I think today the speaker said that there would be complete due diligence and openness, and this bill will be totally vetted mm -hmm. throughout the legislative process, which is welcome news, given the amount of um, suspect and, um, and misgivings that the public had about the t blast. If you're a commissioner in one of the counties anywhere in the state of Georgia, are you a little frustrated right now? Are you looking at the legislature and saying, what are you kicking the ball down the court, uh, to, down the field to us for? I, I suspect that both the, the municipal <coughs> association and the county commissioners are going to be meeting a lot over the coming days. And uh, Liz said that, I think it was Liz said that no, no legislator is going to have to say they raise taxes. And they're not going to have to because they're, they're friendly county commissioners and, and local electeds are going to be pointing at them saying they forced us to raise taxes. Well, right, and that's my point. I mean, Greg, you know, the, the public may not necessarily think that the legislature was able to do this in a, in a way that didn't increase their tax bill. Yeah, I mean, that's the, one of the dangers here. Yeah, and, and even the fee on electric drivers is still a new fee. Um, I'll say this, the big three, L Lieutenant Governor Cago, Governor Deal, and House Speaker Ralston all went to the Georgia Municip Municipal Association's mayoral breakfast just on Monday and warned. We didn't know the contours of the bill quite yet, but they warned them, this will be painful. Get ready. <laughs> painful for you right. guys, painful for you. but <laughs> not for our members. Right. I mean, are, do you, how do you feel, have you had a chance to talk to any of your uh, Democratic uh, uh, legislators about this? Well, we just start, we, I mean, the press well, conference understand. only happened I at uh, 3.45 this afternoon. But you have a cell phone. Yeah, I do, I do, and so do they. And uh, yeah, we have started the conversation. There are, I mean, let, let's start from the place that we all know that we have to have transportation fix in Georgia, fixes mm -hmm. in Georgia. I mean, we just know that. And we also know that you have to, a, a, attack that by revenue increase. I mean, we or or shift or whatever fee or whatever it is that we're going to call it. I mean, it has to happen. So I don't think anybody's against this happening. The, the question comes in is how we're going to handle it. And as you are always fond of saying, you know, the devil's in the details. You know, how is this going to impact the locals? I mean, this is not the first time we've seen this in Georgia where we've done a shift. Mm -hmm. uh, and and so we have county and local governments that are already strained with education. We have local governments that are strained in a whole host of ways. I mean, the other thing is if we start peeling some of this back and the layers of the taxes that they currently have some flexibility with, you know, particularly with things like East Blast, if we don't continue that, that's the 80% of how local governments build their school facilities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot in this. Well, I mean, I think if you think about just the city of Atlanta as a given example, I got a nice call from the mayor the other day encouraging me to participate in the community forums about the infrastructure bond mm -hmm. referendum. So he's already in the city council in Atlanta have already taken measures and steps um, to have a bond referendum put to the put to the voters to improve infrastructure within the city of Atlanta. So then you're asking city residents who already pay eight cents because we're improving our sewer system at the same time, you know, to then come back and you know potentially go up to eleven cents if if the city council were able or the Fulton County Commission were able to pass the three cents without going back to the voters. That's eleven cents that that, that the city taxpayers are paying. That's quite significant. So we're going to see quite a debate taking place and, and watch the details unfold in the days ahead. Yeah, and I can say already, too, the mass transit advocates are very, very at least encouraged by what they see. I had some tell me that even one dollar in the budget line would be a, a victory to them because the state has never dedicated funding for mass transit before until until it looks like this. Well, year. Let me ask you a real quick question, then we got to move on. It, the speaker holds this news conference this afternoon. When you have leadership like that uh, making a proposal like this, is it fair to assume that the governor is has been talking to them about this and that he's certainly suggesting he, he thinks this plan works, or should we not make that assumption? We've been told he is having behind-the-scenes discussions with, with the key players, and he said that on the record as well. Um, but his statement today, there was not an endorsement of what they were doing. He right. said it's a very strong st starting point. Okay, fine. Um, this issue is going to be with us for the next 34, 33 days, I'm sure. So we'll move on to another one. Um, real hot button issue. We've talked about it several times, but it still remains hot. Sam Teasley's bill regarding religious liberties. Um, we had two competing news conferences today, um, as Pat St. Clair reported. So the issue is only apparently more controversial than it was 
in the first place. Um, Todd, I will tell you, I'm really having a hard time personally getting to the bottom of this fight over whether this bill is somehow purely about protecting religious liberties, primarily of Christians, because that's the group, those are the groups that talk about it most, or, or whether there is some component there that will allow government and businesses too to be able to make choices about the kind of people they want in their organizations. How do we get to the bottom of that? Well, first of all, I, I would say that it's not, that there's no sense in which this protects only Christians or, or only protects Christians' rights. It is designed and expressly says any religious preferences, any religious uh, practices. So the Muslims in Kennesaw, who had a hard time getting a mosque up there, this bill would protect them? I, I believe so. Okay. I, I'm told there's other federal legislation okay. that, that already covers that, but it should, yes. Okay. How do we get to the bottom of that? I mean, how do, how do, I, mean I, I realize that this is a tricky issue. Somebody's right about this, Greg. Yeah, and, and, and it might end up, I mean, there's going to be hearings on this, there's going to be more rallies, there's going to be more protests, just like we saw the la in the first few weeks of the legislative session. Um, but it's the funny thing about it is we still haven't had a, a committee vote on this yet this year, and there's already been so much attention. And then on the Senate side, there isn't even a bill drafted yet that we've seen publicly. So, Liz, what is the evidence that this bill does have a darker purpose, which is to give government and business an opportunity, if they so choose, to discriminate against gays and lesbians, against other groups they wanted to. What's the evidence? Well, if you take what was said during the press conference today, the first press conference of the people who support the legislation, they specifically said that it, in this day, Muslims are not being discriminated against, Jews are not being discriminated right. against. This is, we're talking about Christians who are being discriminated against. Right, which is why I made that point. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's a pretty hard case to make in this day and age, particularly for people in the Muslim community, what we've seen in Kennesaw. Um, I mean, we, the, uh, these other populations don't make up a large percentage of, of, of anything. So, that, I mean, that, and that comes from the folks who are supporting the bill. I mean, we don't believe that you need a license to discriminate, which is essentially what this bill would do. The fact is, is that you shouldn't be allowed, and corporations are afraid that their employees will decide independently. Uh, that they can make a choice about their religion and then put the corporation at risk. The authors have changed their language three different times. Corporations are included, corporations are not included. Do we know where that stands now? Because you're right, businesses have gone in and out of this bill. Well, I'm still understanding there's mostly just a shell of a, of a bill that's standing gotcha. there without a lot, okay. a lot of legislation. But I do know that, they, that both the authors have said corporations are supposed to be in at this point. Um, and we'll have to see where that goes. Loretta, the other night on uh, this program, and it bears uh, repeating, we showed a print ad that appeared in the Columbus Daily Paper, in the Marietta Daily Journal, Josh McCoon's home territory in Columbus, and uh, Sam Teasley's in Marietta. Um, he said his religion gave him the right to make his wife and children obedient, and if Senator McCoon in the Marietta paper gets his way, abusers will be able to hide behind religion in court. You've done communications for government. Mm -hmm. That's a very strong attack. Is it unfair? Well, I mean, we live in a society where free speech is welcome, and they're exercising their right to speak freely. Um, now, whether you think that is uh, over the top, that's for each ind individual person to discern. Okay. What it, what it perhaps doesn't do is add to the conversation in a productive way. Um, and you could say that on either side, right? We have two extremes on this issue. Um, we've heard some hyperbolic language on both sides of the issue. And, and then you have the business community in the middle, which is most concerned about Georgia's brand as mm. we go out and try to recruit new businesses. And issues like this that tend to percolate and get so big and you start to get that extreme language paints Georgia with a poor brushstroke on a larger scale. Even the debate itself tends to have a negative just, impact right, based on what you're itself, suggesting. Right, and you can look back in Georgia history and look at other issues that have become quite controversial that have then kind of set Georgia back as, oh, Georgia's kind of not in this century. Yeah, you know, worth reminding people, Greg, that even Jan Brewer, governor of Arizona, 
couldn't move forward on legislation. She had to veto legislation, similar bill uh, in Arizona, where this sort of thing seems to happen all the time. And we're seeing a divide among leaders, even. I mean, House Speaker Ralston has, has, has raised questions about the need for it. But meanwhile, Governor Deal says he's sort of sympathetic. He says it's not his issue, but he's sympathetic to the cause. Last word? Well, well, this is not like the Arizona legislation, which went further. Uh, the other thing I want to say is that, that Josh McCoon has challenged Better Georgia to produce one example of where this has aided and abetted in child abuse or domestic violence, right. and they haven't answered that. Right, right. This is purely to get to get money from people. It's a fundraising ploy, and it's a it's a cry for attention. He was he and Teasley were both very angry and expressed their anger uh, in, in from the wells uh, after they saw this ad on Monday. Oh, absolutely. It's it's far over the top. Okay. Look, we've got more to talk about tonight, including remembering where we were a year ago tonight. And I'd love to hear your stories. Still ahead on lawmakers, we'll talk about whether you were stuck in your car as Atlanta came to a frozen halt on uh, this night back a year uh, past. Remember that snow Mageddon? We'll talk about it. But in the meantime, how well do you know your lawmakers? Representative Mike Dudgeon is a Republican from Johns Creek representing House District 25. He was sworn into the General Assembly in 2011. And that's where he discovered that fellow lawmakers Chip Rogers, Buzz Brockway, and Dan Gassaway had all been at Georgia Tech at the same time, but had never known each other. In addition to bachelor's and master's degrees in electrical engineering from Tech, Dudgeon holds five U.S. patents. Lawmakers returns in a minute. One of the most powerful positions in the Georgia General Assembly is Speaker of the House. The Speaker is elected by the entire membership. The Speaker has always been a member of the majority political party and has the power to schedule debates and to assign members to committees. The current Speaker, David Ralston, was chosen in 2010. Welcome back to Lawmakers. I'm Bill Nygut. Here with us tonight, Todd Ream, Republican political consultant. Liz Flowers, executive director of Georgia Senate Democratic Caucus. AJC political reporter Greg Bluestein and Loretta Lepore, a Republican act activist and media expert. We are going to talk about snowmageddon, snow jam, whatever we call it. Um, but before we do, look, there's some, some news we ought to talk about. School bus drivers, part-time school workers, cafeteria workers, very upset because they... Um, uh, uh, are being told by the governor his budget doesn't include money for uh, for their health insurance. Do we have some developments in that? Yeah, the governor's budget would, would basically save 130 or so million dollars by, by removing them from the uh, from the state health insurance fund. House leaders have, have very strongly said, suggested that they would return that money and, and cover them again in the state health insurance fund. Bad issue for them to get behind on, isn't it? It's a very painful issue for a lot of areas where you've got uh, school systems that are the largest employers, and there's two parts of it. The one is that the bus drivers, the, the other employees will be upset. The other is that you might not be able to, to employ other folks without that benefit. Nobody, nobody goes out to work 20 hours, 30 hours a week. If, if all it is is eleven dollars an hour yeah yeah mm -hmm. and there's also an emotional you know part of this and that parents have name recognition one-on-one -on -one relationships with these bus drivers that are carrying their children to and from school each day that are serving their children in the cafeterias so I think you're going to begin to see some of the PTAs perhaps and some you know more at a local level some you know folks rising up perhaps and reaching out to their legislators and saying hey this is not such a great idea okay you know we're concerned about safety here yeah do you think uh, Democratic members are hearing from their constituents um, on yeah. this and and, uh, and we've been this has been an issue of ours for the past couple of years and the fact is is, is that we, we all tend to think in terms of Metro Atlanta, but the fact is in rural communities, I mean, school cafeteria workers and bus drivers are, you know, really part of the community. Um, so we have to think beyond that and understand that, you know, this was a this was a nonsensical issue political wise. All right. Well, in fairness to the governor, he said he was trying to equalize our part time workers mm -hmm. in other state uh, jobs who don't have health insurance. But nevertheless, it looks like the legislature is going to put that money back in the budget. So we'll watch that one unfold. All right. It's a year later. Were any of you stuck? I mean, out on the highways, or were you no. fortunately none of you? I was. Lucky. You were. Ten hours. 
Wow, and you? Stuck at home. Uh, well, that's you know, not bad. Out. All <laughs> right, Greg, what has happened since a year ago when we were completely frozen in place? How has the state improved, and are, are we ready to take care of the next disaster? We weren't able to deal with the black ice that we saw about two weeks ago on I-20. Yeah, there's been there's more funding for early warning systems, more uh, resources allocated throughout the state for clearing roads and, and different practices for the Georgia State Patrol and the GEMA and other agencies. But the other thing is a more a better sense of coordination. I mean, the, the state and state officials say that they're in constant contact with weather forecasters and school officials and others to make sure there's not a near simultaneous release of, of schools and workers at the same time to flood the roadways. Were you, um, uh, Loretta, um, uh, do you, are you convinced that that we're in the right place on this issue right now, or we still have potential problems Well, I think problems a lot of work there. has been done um, since, since that storm. So as you may recall, the governor put in place the winter weather task force. Yeah. That's a tongue twister. Yeah. Um, but so there well, were a, a bunch of whom said they didn't get contacted when we had this black ice a couple weeks ago. Right. I don't know about that. Yeah, but sure. I do know that, the, that the, the group did come together and put forth 23 or so um, recommendations and all of those on my understanding is have been put in place. And even recently they've put sensors in the road to tell if there's icing at major um, traffic congestion areas. Yeah. Um, and so they did look at other states that are more accustomed to dealing with these types of, of traffic problems and weather tra problems and tried to emulate some of their best practices. Now, they haven't been put to the test and they have to, Greg's point, you know, they've been doing exercises incorporating local, state and federal um, first responders so that they're all coordinated. And, and that's always the one thing in these types of situations where you have, a, you know, uh, this whatever we were calling it, <laughs> Snowopolis or <laughs> whatever, um, you know, whatever the nickname is for it. But communication always is the breakdown. When there's a big failure, when something like that happens, interagency coordination and communication, almost always you go back to that as the root cause of why things Spoken like way someone who does communication yes, for right. a living. Right. Uh, Liz, it never did end up being an issue for Governor Deal to really have to address in his reelection campaign. No. Democrats tried, but it didn't go anywhere. I, I think it came late last year and probably not early enough and not frequently enough. Okay. And it's, I think, hard to make that case in the late of the year. But this winter is still young, so I guess the proof is in the <laughs> All right, good. Long. All right, look, before we uh, leave tonight, we really have to uh, give a pat on the back to our colleague, Greg Bluestein, political reporter from the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, uh, the Washington Post political blog, The Fix, uh, every, I think biennially, don't they? They identify state political reporters who are doing an especially good job for their readers, their viewers. You, uh, your colleague Jim Galloway, and Daniel Malloy were all named by The Fix as being three of the uh, outstanding political journalists in Georgia. So congratulations. And Lori Geary from the And I was going to say, Lori Geary, a channel two, who is, does a terrific job. So congratulations. Thank we're, you. Makes us feel proud to have you with us. You're making me blush. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Todd Reem, Greg Bluestein, Loretta Lepore, and Liz Flowers, thank you so much for being with us tonight. I look forward to many more conversations with all of you as the session moves forward. So that's it. Day seven of the 2015 legislative session is over with. We'll be back tomorrow night with the latest from under the gold dome. In the meantime, stay in touch with us on social media or email us with your thoughts at lawmakers at gpb.org. Thanks for being with us. I'm Bill Nygut. Have a great evening. This is a GPB original production.